Section five of His Last Bow by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section five The Adventure of the Red Circle. Part two. As we walked rapidly down Howe Street, I glanced back at the building which we had left. There, dimly outlined at the top window, I could see the shadow of a head, a woman's head, gazing tensely, rigidly, out into the night, waiting with breathless suspense for the renewal of that interrupted message. At the doorway of the Howe Street flats a man, muffled in a cravat and greatcoat, was leaning against the railing. He started as the whole light fell upon our faces. "'Holmes!' he cried. "'Why, Gregson,' said my companion, as he shook hands with the Scotland Yard detective. "'Journeys end with lovers' meetings. What brings you here?' "'The same reasons that bring you, I expect,' said Gregson. "'How you got on to it, I can't imagine.' "'Different threads, but leading up to the same tangle. I've been taking the signals.' "'Signals?' Yes, from that window. They broke off in the middle. We came over to see the reason, but since it is safe in your hands, I see no object in continuing this business. Wait a bit, cried Gregson eagerly. I'll do you this justice, Mr. Holmes, that I was never in a case yet that I didn't feel stronger for having you on my side. There's only the one exit to these flats, so we have him safe. Who is he? Well, well. We score over you for once, Mr. Holmes. You must give us best this time." He struck his stick sharply upon the ground, on which a cabman, his whip in his hand, sauntered over from a four-wheeler which stood on the far side of the street. "'May I introduce you to Mr. Sherlock Holmes?' he said to the cabman. "'This is Mr. Leverton of Pinkerton's American Agency.' "'The hero of the Long Island Cave Mystery,' said Holmes. "'Sir, I am pleased to meet you.' The American, a quiet, business-like young man, with a clean-shaven, hatchet face, flushed up at the words of commendation. "'I am on the trail of my life now, Mr. Holmes,' said he. "'If I can get Gorgiano.' "'What? Gorgiano, of the Red Circle?' "'Oh, he has a European fame, has he? Well, we've learned all about him in America.' We know he is at the bottom of fifty murders, and yet we have nothing positive we can take him on. I tracked him over from New York, and I've been close to him for a week in London, waiting some excuse to get my hand on his collar. Mr. Gregson and I ran him to ground in that big tenement house, and there's only one door, so he can't slip us. There's three folk come out since he went in, but I'll swear he wasn't one of them. Mr. Holmes talks of signals, said Gregson. I expect, as usual, he knows a good deal that we don't. In a few clear words, Holmes explained the situation as it had appeared to us. The American struck his hands together with vexation. "'He's on to us,' he cried. "'Why do you think so?' "'Well, it figures out that way, does it not? Here he is, sending out messages to an accomplice. There are several of his gang in London. Then suddenly, just as by your own account he was telling them that there was danger, he broke short off.' What could it mean except that from the window he had suddenly either caught sight of us in the street, or in some way come to understand how close the danger was, and that he must act right away if he was to avoid it? What do you suggest, Mr. Holmes? That we go up at once and see for ourselves. But we have no warrant for his arrest. He is in unoccupied premises under suspicious circumstances, said Gregson. That is good enough for the moment. When we have him by the heels, we can see if New York can't help us to keep him. I'll take the responsibility of arresting him now." Our official detectives may blunder in the matter of intelligence, but never in that of courage. Gregson climbed the stair to arrest this desperate murderer, with the same absolutely quiet and business-like bearing with which he would have ascended the official staircase of Scotland Yard. The Pinkerton man had tried to push past him, but Gregson had firmly elbowed him back. London dangers were the privilege of the London force. The door of the left-hand flat upon the third landing was standing ajar. Gregson pushed it open. Within all was absolute silence and darkness. I struck a match and lit the detective's lantern. As I did so, and as the flicker steadied into a flame, we all gave a gasp of surprise. 
on the deal boards of the carpetless floor, there was outlined a fresh track of blood. The red steps pointed towards us and led away from an inner room, the door of which was closed. Gregson flung it open and held his light full blaze in front of him, while we all peered eagerly over his shoulders. In the middle of the floor of the empty room was huddled the figure of an enormous man, his clean-shaven, swarthy face grotesquely horrible in its contortion, and his head encircled by a ghastly crimson halo of blood, lying in a broad wet circle upon the white woodwork. His knees were drawn up, his hands thrown out in agony, and from the centre of his broad, brown, upturned throat there projected the white haft of a knife driven blade deep into his body. Giant as he was, the man must have gone down like a pole-axed ox before that terrific blow. Beside his right hand a most formidable horn-handled, two-edged dagger lay upon the floor, and near it a black kid glove. "'By George! It's Black Gorgiano himself!' cried the American detective. "'Someone has got ahead of us this time.' "'Here is the candle in the window, Mr. Holmes,' said Gregson. "'Why, whatever are you doing?' Holmes had stepped across, had lit the candle, and was passing it backward and forward across the window-panes. Then he peered into the darkness, blew the candle out, and threw it on the floor. "'I rather think that will be helpful.' said he. He came over and stood in deep thought while the two professionals were examining the body. "'You say that three people came out from the flat while you were waiting downstairs. Did you observe them closely?' "'Yes, I did.' "'Was there a fellow about thirty, black-bearded, dark, of middle size?' "'Yes. He was the last to pass me.' "'That is your man, I fancy.' I can give you his description, and we have a very excellent outline of his footmark. That should be enough for you. Well, not much, Mr. Holmes, among the millions of London. Perhaps not. That is why I thought it best to summon this lady to your aid. We all turned round at the words. There, framed in the doorway, was a tall and beautiful woman, the mysterious lodger of Bloomsbury. Slowly she advanced her face pale and drawn with a frightful apprehension, her eyes fixed and staring, her terrified gaze riveted upon the dark figure on the floor. "'You have killed him,' she muttered. "'Oh, dear me, you have killed him!' Then I heard a sharp intake of her breath, and she sprang into the air with a cry of joy. Round and round the room she danced, her hands clapping, her dark eyes gleaming with delighted wonder, and a thousand pretty Italian exclamations pouring from her lips. It was terrible and amazing to see such a woman so convulsed with joy at such a sight. Suddenly she stopped, and gazed at us all with a questioning stare. "'But you! You are police, are you not? You have killed Giuseppe Corgiano. Is it not so?' "'We are police, madam.' She looked round into the shadows of the room. But where, then, is Gennaro? she asked. He's my husband, Gennaro Luca. I am Emilia Luca, and we are both from New York. Where is Gennaro? He called me this moment from this window, and I ran with all my speed. It was I who called, said Holmes. You? How could you call? Your cipher was not difficult, madam. Your presence here was desirable. I knew that I had only to flash Vieni, and you would surely come." The beautiful Italian looked with awe at my companion. "'I do not understand how you know these things,' she said. "'Giuseppe Gorgiano, how did he—' She paused, and then suddenly her face lit up with pride and delight. Oh, now I see it, my Gennaro, my splendid, beautiful Gennaro, who has guarded me safe from no harm. He did it. With his own strong hands, he killed the monster. Oh, Gennaro, how wonderful you are! What a woman could ever be worthy of a, such a man? Well, Mrs. Luca, said the prosaic Gregson, laying his hand upon the lady's sleeve with as little sentiment as if she were a Notting Hill hooligan. 
I am not very clear yet who you are or what you are. We have said enough to make it very clear that we shall want you at the yard. One moment, Gregson, said Holmes. I rather fancy that this lady may be as anxious to give us information as we can be to get it. You understand, madam, that your husband will be arrested and tried for the death of the man who lies before us. What you say may be used in evidence, but if you think that he has acted from motives which are not criminal, and which he would wish to have known, then you cannot serve him better than by telling us the whole story. Now that Gordiano is dead, we fear nothing, said the lady. He was a devil and a monster, and there can be no judge in the world who would punish my husband for have killed him. In that case, said Holmes, my suggestion is that we lock this door, leave things as we found them, go with this lady to her room, and form our opinion after we have heard what it is that she has to say to us. Half an hour later we were seated, all four, in the small sitting-room of Signora Luca, listening to her remarkable narrative of those sinister events, the ending of which we had chanced to witness. She spoke in rapid and fluent, but very unconventional English which for the sake of clearness I will make grammatical. I was born in Posilipo near Naples, said she, and was the daughter of Augusto Barelli, who was the chief lawyer and also the deputy of that part. Gennaro was in my father's employment, and I came to love him, as any woman must. He had neither money nor position, nothing but his beauty and strength and energy. So my father forbade the match. We fled together. We married at Bari and sold my jewels to gain the money which would take us to America. This was four years ago, and we have been in New York ever since. Fortune was very good to us at first. Gennaro was able to do a service to an Italian gentleman. He saved him from some ruffians in the place called the Boweri, and so made a powerful friend. His name was Tito Castellotti, and he was the senior partner of the great firm of Castellotti and Zamba, who are the chief fruit importers of New York. Signor Zamba is an invalid, and our new friend Castellotti has a power within the firm, which employs more than three hundred men. He took my husband into his employment, made him head of the department, and showed him his good will towards him in every way. Signor Castellotti was a bachelor, and I believe that he felt as if Gennaro was his son, and both my husband and I loved him as if he were our father. We had taken a furnished a little house in Brooklyn, and our whole future seemed assured when that black cloud appeared which was soon to overspread our sky. One night, when Gennaro returned from his work, he brought a fellow countryman back with him. His name was Gorgiano, and he had come out from Posilipo. He was a huge man, as you can testify, for you have looked upon his corpse. Not only was his body that of a child, but everything about him was grotesque, gigantic, and terrifying. His voice was like thunder in our little house. There was scarce room for the whirl of his great arms as he talked. His thoughts, his emotions, his passions, all were exaggerated and monstrous. He talked or rather roared with such energy that others could but sit and listen. Coward with the might stream of words, his eyes blazed at you and held you with his mercy. He was terrible and wonderful man. I thank God that he is dead. He came again and again, yet I was aware that Gennaro was no more happy than I was in his presence. Ah, my poor husband would sit pale and listlessly, listening to the endless raving upon politics and upon social questions with made-up or visitors' conversation. Gennaro said nothing, but... I, who knew him so well, could read in his face some emotion which I had never seen there before. At first I thought that it was dislike, and then, gradually, I understood that it was more than dislike. It was fear, a deep, secret, shrinking fear. 
that night the night that i read his terror i put my arms round him and i implored him by his love for me and by all that he held dear to hold nothing from me and to tell me why this huge man overshadowed him so he told me and my own heart grew cold as ice as i listened my poor Gennaro, in his wild and fiery days, when all the world seemed against him, and his mind was driven half mad by the injustice of life, had joined a Neapolitan society, the Red Circle, which was allied to the old Carbonari. The oath and secret of this brotherhood was frightful, but once within its rule, no escape was possible when we had fled to america gennaro thought that he had cast in all off forever what was his horror when even to meet in the street the very man who had initiated him in naples the giant gorgiano a man who had earned the name of death in the south of italy for he was red to the elbow in murder he had come to new york to avoid the italian police and he had already planted a branch of this dreadful society in his new home. All this Gennaro told me and showed me a summons we had received that very day. A red circle draw upon the head of it telling him that a lodge would be held upon a certain date, and that his presence at it was required and ordered. That was bad enough, but worse was to come i had noticed for some time that when gorgiano came to us as he constantly did in the evening he spoke much to me and even when his words were to my husband those terrible glaring white beast eyes of his were always turned upon me one night his secret came out i had awakened that he called love with him the love of a brute a savage Gennaro had not yet returned when he came. He pushed his way in, seized me in his might arms, hugged me in his bare embrace, covered me with kisses, and implored me to come away with him. I was struggling and screaming when Gennaro entered and attacked him. He struck Gennaro senseless and fled from the house, which he was never more to enter it was a deadly enemy that we made the night a few days later came the meeting gennaro returned from it with a face which told me that something dreadful had occurred it was worse than we could have imagined possible the funds of the society were raised by blackmailing rich italians and threatening them with violence should they refuse the money it seems that Castellot, our dear friend and benefactor, had been approached. He had refused to yield the threats, and he had handed the notice to the police. It was resolved now that such an example should be made of them as would prevent any other victim from rebelling. At the meeting it was arranged that he and his house should be blown up with dynamite there was a drawing of lots as to who should carry out the deed gennaro saw our enemy's cruel face smiling at him and he dipped his hand in the bag no doubt it had been prehended in some fashion for it was the fatal disc with the red circle upon it the mandate for the murder which lay upon his palm he was to kill his best friend or he was to expose himself and me to the vengeance of these comrades it was part of their fiendish system to punish those whom they feared or hated by injuring not only their own persons but those who they loved and it was the knowledge of this which hung as a terror over my poor gennaro's head and drove him near crazy with apprehension all that night we sat together our arms round each other each is threatening each for the troubles that lay before us the very next evening had been fixed for the tempt 
by midday my husband and i were on our way to london but not before he had given our benefactor full warning of this danger and had also left such information for the police as would safeguard his life for the future the rest gentlemen you know for yourselves we are sure that our enemies would be behind us like our own shadows gorgiano has his private reasons for vengeance but in any case we knew how ruthless cunning and untiring he could be both italy and america are full of stories of his dreadful powers if ever they were deserted it would be now my darling made use of the few clear days which our start had given us in arranging for refuge for me in such a fashion that no possible danger could reach me for his own part he wished to be free that he might communicate both with the american and with the italian police i do not myself know where he lived or how all that i learned was through the columns of a newspaper but once as i looked through my window i saw two italians watching the rouse and understood that in some way gorgiano had found a retreat finally gennaro told me through the paper that he would signal to me from a certain window but when the signals came they were nothing but warnings which were suddenly interrupted it's very clear to me now that he knew gorgiano to be close upon him and that thank god he was ready for him when he came and now gentlemen i would ask you whether we have anything to fear from the law or whether any judge upon earth would condemn my gennaro for what he has done well mr gregson said the american looking across at the official i don't know what your british point of view may be but i guess that in new york this lady's husband will receive a pretty general vote of thanks she'll have to come with me and see the chief gregson answered if what she says is corroborated i do not think she or her husband has much to fear but what i can't make head or tail of mr holmes is how on earth you got yourself mixed up in the matter education gregson education still seeking knowledge at the old university well watson you have one more specimen of the tragic and grotesque to add to your collection by the way it is not eight o'clock and a wagner night at covent garden if we hurry we might be in time for the second act end of section five